I heard an old story. Thank you for tuning in to the television ministry of Clay's Mill Baptist Church. Join us as we share our passion for soul winning, spiritual growth, and revival in our state and nation. And now, Pastor Jeff Fugit. Well, good evening and welcome to the program tonight. I trust things are going well for you and your family. I sure am thankful for the goodness of the Lord. I was preaching in Michigan this past Monday and Tuesday, and I told the folks as I stood to preach on a Monday night, I said, I don't know if you've heard the news or not. In fact, it has been censored in a lot of places. They don't want folks to hear this, but God's still on his throne. The Bible is still the word of God, and Jesus is coming soon. Isn't that a wonderful thing? I'm glad tonight that we're on the winning side. I look forward to our time together this evening, and you'll enjoy the singing, and uh, you'll enjoy the program, I believe, and then the message of this evening from Psalm number 11. If you do not have a church to attend tomorrow morning, we'd love to have you come and be with us here at the Clays Mill Baptist Church, 1220 Brandon Road. Sunday school begins at 930 the church service at 10.30, and church tomorrow evening at 6 o'clock. Let me encourage you to be in Sunday school. Our classes are open again, and we have adult Sunday school classes. Uh, we have graded Sunday school classes for our nursery, toddler, preschool, grade school, and high school, and they meet in their individual classes. We'd love to have you come and be a part of a Sunday school class and there is a class for every age, every grade, and every group. I teach right here in the auditorium, and I'll be teaching it tomorrow morning, and we're in a series on the power of God, the omnipotence of God, or the fact that God is able. Folks, I encourage you to look back over history and to realize when times are dark, that's when the sun, uh, when it comes up, shines the brightest. And these are days of opportunity. Uh, these are days for the church to stand and to shine and to move forth, uh, forward uh, in the work of God. We're excited about getting started on our next building here. Our next building will be a multi-purpose building, and it will seat about twice of what we have here in this auditorium. And that is good because last Sunday uh, we are getting close to full again, and uh, we're excited about what God is doing. And so this next building, uh, we are raising money, and I'm uh, giving our folks uh, the details of that uh, in these days of January and we have 10 steps to get the next building up and get it dried in and then we'll move to phase two on the construction and I'll be giving the details about that uh, in church uh, tomorrow and in the coming days in the month of January. We'd love to have you come visit with us. We also have Bible study Wednesday night at seven o'clock right here in the church auditorium and uh, we enjoy uh, studying the word of God uh, together. I appreciate you watching Watching tonight, if you will take the time to share this program to your page if you're watching uh, by way of Facebook. And I appreciate those that are also watching by way of television, and the majority of our folks do so, and uh, they watch it on WLJC television, and we appreciate uh, this opportunity. Here's my boys and wife to sing, and you're going to enjoy this good song. I read the back of the book, and we win. I've been reading in the Bible about the ending of the age And one thing that's for certain, it draws closer every day But I am not concerned about the way it's gonna end Cause I've read the back of the book and we win I've read the back of the book and we win no more living in darkness, we'll be living at home again. See, there ain't no need to worry about it if you're born again. I've read the back of the book and we win. We all want to be winners in the games of life that we play. And friends, since I'm a sinner, I've already lost the race. 
But Jesus' blood can take my sin and throw it in the deep blue sea. He can put it into my last place living. Give me the victory. No, I can sing. I read the back of the book and we win. No more living in darkness. We'll be living at home again. See, there ain't no need to worry about it if you're born again. I've read the back of the book, can we win? I've read the back of the book, can we win? No more living in darkness, we'll be living at home again. There ain't no need to worry about it if you're born again. I've read the back of the book, can we win? There ain't no need to worry about it if you're born I'm preaching tonight from Psalm number 11. It is verse number 3 that gets our attention in this passage of Scripture. In fact, verse number 3 has often got the attention of the reader and even the preacher to the place that the rest of the chapter goes uh, unnoticed. And if we don't read the rest of the chapter, we are left with little or no hope. Here's what the Bible says in verse number 3. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The psalmist says, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? As far as our nation is concerned, there is much frustration going on. Uh, there is much disappointment. We're disappointed in a lot of things as far as our nation is concerned. And when we look at the foundation of our nation, the fact that America uh, was founded on a Christian heritage and history, and to realize how far we've come from that, it causes us to look at this question and wonder if there is an answer. We look at the foundation, our nation founded on the fact uh, that uh, uh, Judeo-Christian values, our nation founded on the fact of a patriotism, a love for our country, a, an admiration and a respect for the flag that represents the freedom of our nation, uh, the fact that God is the creator of the world and everything in it, and all of these things are part of the foundation of our nation. When we look at those things, we realize that they're being disrespected or they're being ignored or they're being destroyed. And we look at this verse and we look at this question and sometimes we just see the one verse and we throw up our hands and say, well, I don't know if the righteous can do anything. Let's look at all of the psalm tonight and be encouraged by the word of God. Psalm number 11, beginning in verse number 1, the Bible says, In the Lord put I my trust. How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? For lo, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string that they may privily shoot at the upright. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked in him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. Upon the wicked shall he rain snares, fire, and brimstone, and in horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness, his countenance doth behold the upright. If we outlined this chapter this evening, we would uh, outline it in this way. The psalmist expresses his fears in verses 1, 2, and 3. In verses 4, 5, and 6, 
he examines the facts. In verse number 7, he exhorts us to have faith in God. I want us to look quickly at the first part as he examines his fears. He begins with his faith in God, that is his position in verse number 1, but then he said, when I look at what is going on around me and what it is, there are those that hide and shoot privily at the upright to destroy that which is good. When I see that, he said, I feel like saying, I wish I was like a bird that could just fly away. I wish I could just leave all of the turmoil. I wish I could just get away from the wickedness that's going on around me. But he doesn't end there. He's just talking about looking at first or face value of what's going on, looking at the circumstances around him. And he said, I, I wish I could just, just fly away. And I'm not going to take much time here, but his fears are founded in things that are very similar to the things that concern us today. We see those that shoot at the upright privily. It seems that if you want to get criticized, if you want to be mocked, if you want to be made fun of in this nation, you do what's right. You stand for the Constitution as a patriot. You stand for the Bible as a Christian. And it seems like, well, if you do that, there are those organized to mock, to make fun, or to shoot privily at the righteous. That's what he said his fears were. And he talks about all of these things in uh, these three verses. Now, I'm not going to go into that tonight because we already know what our fears are. We already know what our concerns are. And we already know what our frustrations are when it comes to uh, the nation uh, that we live in. And I want you to notice as we go to the second part, as David explains the facts of what's going on. In verse number four, he goes back to where he starts in verse number one. He said, I want to tell you, we look at the circumstances and it brings fear. But then he said, I want you to notice the Lord is in his holy temple. If you're not careful, you'll just look at the circumstances and you won't see that God is still on the throne. And so after he examines his fears, he examines the facts. And he says this, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyelids behold his eyes, his eyelids try the children of men. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked in him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. Upon the wicked shall he rain snares, fire and brimstone, and in horrible tempest, this shall be the portion of their cup. No matter what the problem may be around us, whether it would be an individual or an international problem, uh, he declares that, that God is sufficient. I want to encourage us tonight uh, to understand that God is on his throne and God is in control. Do you understand that the wicked are dependent on God for their heart to beat their mind to function, for their life to continue. You understand that God can take away their life. He can take away their ability to think. He can take away their ability to move and to maneuver in their wickedness. And so we understand tonight, and we must understand that God is in control. And God is paying attention he knows those who are right and righteous. He knows those that are sinful. And he knows those that are evil. And David points out that the Lord sees. And when he sees, God judges what he sees. The Bible tells us that he loves the righteous. And the Bible tells us that his soul hates the wickedness of mankind. 
I must remind us tonight that God is not dead. He is not blind. He is very much alive. He is very much alert. And God is looking. In fact, he says it twice. He says that God looks. And then he says his eyelids try. Or God focuses in on the wicked. Now, we have a lot of ideas and theories and worries and concerns about certain places and people, and we wonder, boy, is that the cause of the problem? God knows what the source of the problem is. God knows that are working behind the scenes to manipulate, to deceive, to lead a world into sin and wickedness and destruction. The Lord sees, the Lord he, his eyes saw uh, the behavior of King Saul. He saw the hatred that Saul had. He saw the obedience of David. He saw the righteousness of David. Now sometimes we think that God doesn't know because we get into places of danger uh, as David did. And David, of course, in this psalm was running from Saul. Uh, Saul had become evil in his jealousy and hatred toward David and he wanted to kill him. And we think in those days, well, God has forgotten us. God has not forgotten God does see those that are wicked. He does see those uh, that are uh, righteous. He does look upon that and God responds uh, to what he sees. He tells us in this verse number six, upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire, and brimstone. I don't know about you, but I would not want to live in a prosperity that I knew could end in destruction at any second. I'd rather live doing what is right in the sight of God. And even if it, even if it brought trial, even if it brought affliction, even if it brought the scorn of the enemy, knowing that as I do right, I can continue until my day comes that I enter into glory. And God says here, I want you to know that you're not being forgotten. And I do see, in fact, if you took this time in history and you look back at God's behavior, God had judged the wicked and God had blessed the righteous. I think of the days of Noah. God judged the land. He gave them 120 years to get right. Oh, Noah was a person of righteousness. He was a parent of righteousness. He was a preacher of righteousness. And 120 years of mercy and grace God gave as Noah preached righteousness. Of course, they mocked and they scorned. When judgment came, dear friend, and the mighty waters rose up on the earth, and men began to drown, and death took the place of life on the earth there in that little ark, that place of safety. And of course, it was huge as it was, but compared to the flood, it was just a small ark upon the face of those waters, and God protected Noah and his family. Can I tell you tonight, God is in control Look back to see how many times God did eventually judge the wicked and bless the righteous. Now, God hasn't changed. He's the same today. If we're not careful, we will worry our lives away. We will worry our purpose away. We will worry our work for God away. And we spend time in fears and wonders and concerns. I say tonight, let's serve God. Let's serve him with a fervor. Let's serve him with a joy. Let's serve him with a passion. Let's serve him with a faith, knowing and believing that God is in control. David's fears were conquered by his faith as he reviewed God's behavior in the past and believed with all of his heart that God would do it again. By the way, we can look back at this story and say, you know what? Saul was defeated and David did win. Wickedness was defeated in judgment and righteousness was blessed and it prevailed. And that happened in every generation. It happened in every dispensation. Sometimes it gets dark, doesn't it? 
Sometimes we look around us and we wonder, who can we trust? I mean, can we, can we not have a fair election in our nation anymore? What's going to happen to our country? We look at all these things, and, and it does become dark. If you're not careful, dear friend, you'll focus on the darkness, and you'll forget God's still on the throne. God's still in control, and we need to trust him, and not only trust him, but not worry our lives away, not worry our days away but have confidence and faith in God. When we come to verse number 7, David then exhorts us. He challenges us. He tells us, have faith in God. He tells us that. Let's look at verse number 7. For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. His countenance doth behold the upright. He, he, he upholds, uh, he, he, he uh, beholds the upright. You know what God sees? God sees your prayer of faith in the morning. God sees your reading of his word. God sees you giving out a gospel track. God sees you witnessing and sharing the gospel. God sees you shining the light of right and righteousness in a dark world. God sees that and God rewards that. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, he said, Timothy, in the last days, perilous times are going to come. And as he began to chronicle, he began to list the things that would happen. We're there tonight. We're right there exactly where Paul said we would be in those days of the return of Christ. You know what the instruction for Timothy was? It wasn't fear. In fact, he told uh, Timothy, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of a sound mind. God has not given us fear. And he told Timothy, he said, Timothy, I want you to continue in the same things that you've always done. Don't you let those who seem to prosper in their wickedness fool you or cause you to envy them? Let's keep doing right. We are. We are, in fact, on the winning side. What happens? The righteous will win in the end. So let's stand. Let's proclaim. Let's preach boldly. The truth of the word of God. Listen to me now. The wicked cannot become our enemy. They must become the people that we give the gospel to, working to win them to Christ and the winning side. One of the things I often warn folks about is if you see others through the eyes of politics, you see, the other, uh, you see others through the eyes of the media, You'll hate the people that God loves so much that he gave his son for that they could have eternal life. We're on the winning side. Let's work to get somebody else converted to the winning side. Don't you let those who would laugh at you, those who would mock. In fact, our hearts should be broken for those that reject the God of heaven. We know what happens to people who reject God. We know what happens to those and to a nation that would reject God. The Bible says that they'll be turned into hell. I don't know about you, but I don't want that for anyone. I don't want folks to die without Christ. I want them to know that Jesus loves them and he gave his life that they could have eternal life. Here's what we need to let everyone know. First of all, all of us are sinners. All of us were born sinners. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. Second of all, we must tell folks the gospel story that there is a penalty for sin. The Bible says for the wages of sin is death. Revelation 20, the Bible said, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. 
But Jesus died to pay for our sin and to make us a child of God, to make us a child of the King, to allow us to be a part, to be adopted into the family of God. How do we do that? It is by grace through faith in Christ. The Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. If you've never received him, you ought to receive him right now as your personal savior. Thank you for watching. Here's a good song you'll enjoy as we go off the air this evening. If I leave this world of sorrow sometime before you do, just look for me in heaven and we'll talk the ages through. But if at first you fail to see me let me tell you where i'll be i'll be thanking christ my savior for saving a wretch like me but if you should reach that city before my time has come perhaps you'd like to greet me when my race down here is run just wait for how soon be coming across life's ebbing sea and i'll tell you now dear loved one just where to wait for me don't look Beneath the gates of pearl Don't look on the streets of gold Don't look by the walls of jasper Nor among the many signs untold For I've been longing and I been waiting for the precious Holy One to see. There I'll be through the countless ages. Look for me at Jesus' feet. Oh, look for me through the countless ages look for me at jesus feet